step back and explain the video a little bit quickly. So there's different types of the way video is captured and processed in the cameras and through the switchers. Uh, an interlay signal, which is the most common output out of most broadcast cameras, and is mainly used with the, with the live output because it's bandwidth tolerant. It's, it's 1.85 uh, gigabits, 1.485 gig per second. Whereas a 3G output, 1080p, is 3 gig per second processing. Now that all comes into the cable lengths and everything else. Like so the common output of most cameras today still in HD is an interlaced signal. What that means is you get one field, the next field, one field, the next field, one field, and they come together very quickly to create a full field. Your eye never sees that. Television has been like that since the 1940s. That fundamental technology of TV has not changed much since that day. What happens is when you take somebody with stripes on their shirt and you have that kind of an image capture and you don't have the correct processing, then what happens is as that camera's shooting and that guy's moving, the fields, as they're painting them and laying them back together, get out of whack. And you see the shirt start doing that, right? So what you want to do, there's a couple ways that you can get around that when you design the system. You can actually take this and convert it to a progressive scan. That fixes that. Um, but that's the general concept of what's happening there. All right, so we talked about set design, clothing, right? So here's a couple things, too, and I'm just going to pitch Panasonic's uh, dynamic range stretch feature that's on their cameras. And again, uh, I don't work for Panasonic. I don't got a dog in the hunt. But the dynamic range stretch is an amazing feature that's on most of those cameras over there. And basically what it does is it looks at the image on the camera in a pixel group by pixel group and adjusts those on the output based on each group. What most other cameras do is they look at the whole image and they make adjustments based on the whole image. So what the heck does that mean? Why is that important, right? Let's say you have a pastor who's got really dark skin and he's standing in front of a very lighted background, right? A lot of, lot of light behind him and he's a dark skinned pastor. Maybe he's, got a, maybe he's got a light colored suit or he's in front of a light background. What's going to happen is with a traditional camera is you either have to iris down because of the, the surrounding light. And if you do that, what happens is all the detail in his face is gone. Now, let's say you got a light skin pastor with a nice dark suit with some nice patterns on it. And you got him, same issue. You either got him iris properly and you lose all the detail in the suit or vice versa. So that dynamic range stretch is absolutely amazing when you have that type of situation, which always happens in churches. The image quality that comes off of that camo dynamic, and that also dynamic range stretch helps with defeating some of those issues with moray patterns as well, because the camera's picking out specific blocks and understanding what image is looking at. Um, I haven't seen any other cameras that do as good a job as the Panasonic. So it's a pretty cool feature. These guys over here, that lights in my face, I can't barely make you guys out. The dynamic range stretch works kind of like that. It can say, block that out, focus on that. You know, you guys are the same way. I can barely see you with those lights, but if I block that light out, now I can see you clearly. It's, it kind of does that on a pixel block by pixel block uh, process. Does that make sense? Really cool feature. So here's the other kicker. If you don't get good capture with your video quality and your audio quality, you are stuck. I had a lady friend of mine who uh, works at our church. She's a professional video production person. She worked at CNN, um, and she did a, a big project, and they captured the audio, and it was all overdriven, all of it. So she called me up and said, hey, is there anything you guys know about up at DB that you can fix this thing? Because I shot the whole project, and, and it's all overdriven. I said, well, no. You got to go back and reshoot it. Sorry. So. Understanding on the front side, getting a correct, good quality image, get, getting your lighting and your cameras balanced, getting your audio sound properly leveled, you've got to do that on the front side or you're going to be stuck with garbage and you can't fix it. That makes sense to everybody? You can't take a distorted audio and fix it. You can't take a really bad grainy video image and make it look pretty. Even though on TV they show you these cool you know, shows where the high-tech guys can make the license plate all of a sudden appear magically, that's baloney, right? Doesn't work that way. My kids don't believe me, but I'm telling them. So this is sort of a, a signal path. I like to do this since I do engineering sometimes. Um, you can go to live recording or you can go to recording for post. So basically, 
what this means is I've got my camera images coming out, and rather than send it live, I'm going to capture it and do stuff to it, and then I'm going to send it out. That makes sense to everybody? Okay. So when you're capturing it live, kind of the same thing. You can have a great image coming out of the camera. If you record it in a really compressed format, and then you try to edit it and then post it and wonder why it looks bad, it's because you didn't have a good enough capture. The quality wasn't good enough when you captured it. Same problem. If you've got great images coming out of the camera and you record a bad image, you ain't fixing that. So making sure that you record in a high enough quality is really critical if you want to do any kind of post-production. Now, it's kind of a balancing act, right? Because here's the deal. If you record uncompressed video off those cameras, that's 1.485 gigabits per second. Per second. Imagine how big that file would be after you recorded for an hour. It's massive, right? So you got to compress it. You got to compress it some. But you, you got to find the right balance between compression and not being able to use it afterwards. So fortunately, most of the products that we have back there or that we sell, you've got a couple industry standard settings that you can set that give you decent compression with still decent quality. And for most of the churches, that's usually uh, Apple ProRes LT. ProRes LT is a pretty high quality compression, and it's a reasonable file size. So when we record a 45-minute uh, you know, talking head thing, it'll probably be, be about 60 gig. Now, to those of you who don't think that's still a big number, that's actually pretty small for high-definition video. So that brings us to the next part of this post-production thing, which is I've got these files. What the heck am I going to do with them? Right? Do I upload it to the web and then let YouTube hang on to it forever? Do I want to archive these? Do I want to put them on a server? The backside of this is I got all these great digital files. Now I've got to have some place to put them. Back in the day, I like to say that, back in the day, because I'm an old dude. Back in the day, we would record our stuff to beta tape or some of the new digital DVC Pro HD tapes that came out. And we would put them on the shelf, and you'd have all the sermons. You'd have all the teachings. And the next thing you know, after about five or six years, you got a giant room full of tapes. And then somebody said, wow, we can do that in DVDs. Then you got a giant rack full of DVDs right back in the day. Now it's all digital. Now you got a giant server full of stuff, right? It's the same basic concept. You're going to take that file. If you want to archive it, you want to put it somewhere where you can pull it back later. There's a couple parts to doing that that are really important. One is when you get 150 programs on your hard drive, how do you find the one you're looking for? So if you don't have the correct nomenclature, there's actually an ISO standard for writing file nomenclature that we typically would recommend. Uh, otherwise, you never find what you're looking for. What well, pastor was talking about, uh, what was he talking about? He was talking about uh, Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. When was that? Was it two years ago? Was it three years ago? And you might spend six days trying to find that particular sermon that he wants his particular thing from. So if you don't set up your architecture properly when you do that, guess what? You're never going to find it. So these are part of the things that you have to consider when you're talking about archiving your video. It, when you archive stuff to the web, similarly, you, you know, you got to remember what video was that. So naming the things is, is really important. Mm -hmm.